<laughs> Take two. Take two. Take two. Thank you for noticing so you get credit. Ah. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. So, I don't take two actions. <laughs> first attempt to drop work. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do the fireworks twice. We don't have the budget for that. So, Dr. Mark and Ray are talking According to my notes, they mentioned that they are from Berkshire Health Systems and they are uh, facing challenging situations in North Adams, a community facing socioeconomic challenges, and they have a grant. I should have said it that way. <laughs> um, and again, thank you very much for allowing us to share some of our challenges. We'll, we'll hand this off back and forth. We've, we've done this before. Um, so basically, as we talk about health these days, we really are talking more and more about what's called population health. And the idea of population health, there's two definitions of it, and I'll give you the one that we're using. The first, basically, is uh, used to describe uh, um, a <coughs> perspective uh, that focuses on the health uh, of patients within a health system. So this, you can imagine, would be attributable patients who are in a health system, and the health system is caring for those patients and being paid for each one of those patients. This, in our minds, is a fairly limited definition of population health. What we're really talking about when we talk about our experiment in North Adams, and frankly, throughout uh, the county, um, is a perspective where you have a geographic area, and basically that geographic area is the Berkshires, and for discussion today, that geographic area is North County with a focus on the town of North Adams, okay? And what you're doing here is focusing just not on the traditional health care uh, providers, but rather you're talking about a multidisciplinary approach to improving health in a very, very broad way. And by the way, all these slides will be available to you if you, if you want. Um, so we're talking about both traditional health care interventions, primary care, specialist care, et cetera, hospitalization, but we're also talking about some very non-traditional interventions, which we hypothesize are going to be very, very important in truly addressing the health care needs of a population which has some severe socioeconomic challenges and severe behavioral challenges. So that's our operational definition. <coughs> What's happened over time in healthcare is we've evolved from a focus on yeah, that, that green, got it? Okay. There's something called the triple aim, and now of course being America, we've upped that to the quadruple aim. I'm not sure where we're gonna go from there, but <laughs> and the, and the original triple aim sort of went like this. Okay, so originally and for those of us who grew up in the healthcare system, the complete <coughs> focus was on that individual experience of care, each and every individual encounter, whether it was a hospital, emergency department, primary care office, you name it. And that was our definition of good healthcare, that each one of those encounters was optimal. What's become very, very clear is that that approach is inadequate to really address the healthcare needs of the country, and certainly of a, an underserved area. So the quadruple aim evolved from Don Berwick to include health of a population, that's the definition we just gave you, a comprehensive approach to the health of a community, and, as you all know, a focus on per capita cost. Since this group sort of focuses on efficiency, et cetera, let's just ask one or two questions. So how much do we spend every year on healthcare in the United States? You're allowed to say a whole lot, but. Exactly, very large percentage. What, what is that percentage? You have any idea? Mm -hmm. Seventeen, heading towards twenty, pretty rapidly, and that's in our GDP is a lot. So the answer is three trillion dollars. Under the efficiency mantra, it looks like about a third of that is wasted. It is providing services that are not required. So there's a trillion dollar opportunity every year. This is every year. Okay. So the focus then is what can we do? to decrease the inefficiency in the system while maintaining high quality. And they're not mutually exclusive. You can have high quality and lower cost. It's been proven to be possible. So the idea is then we need to broaden our horizons as traditional healthcare providers and as communities to be able to balance the individual experience, because it still comes down to that, the health of an entire population, how do we enhance that, but how do we do that in a cost-effective, efficient way? 
The challenge these days, like much of uh, many challenges in the United States, is burnout. So what you have in healthcare, are any of you pre-med? Okay, so I can be blank, blunt about this. <laughs> There's a burnout rate, you know, by formal surveys in healthcare of somewhere around 40 percent, and it's higher, for example, in ICU docs. It's high, very high in primary care docs. It's very low in dermatologists. In case you're wondering what you want to go into, <laughs> they just don't get that excited about, you know. Um, but the idea is you cannot achieve the triple aim if you don't ha have providers who are engaged, who are effective, okay, who are, if you will, non burned out. So this is what we're trying to do. Okay. Now, why are we focusing on North County and why are we focusing our population health on, on uh, Berkshire County? Um, there's something called county health rankings. And for those of you, again, interested in healthcare at all, I commend this website to you. And it basically ranks every county in the United States in terms of its healthcare outcomes and in terms of those determinants or factors that drive that. So when you look at Massachusetts, which by the way is fairly highly ranked in terms of overall health care. Trust me, you do not want to be in Mississippi, Alabama, places like this. Their health care outcomes are unfortunately not good. Massachusetts usually ranks about number three or number four in the whole country. But within the state, there are profound difference in terms, differences in terms of health care outcomes. And Berkshire County and Northern Berkshire County unfortunately, are ranked number 11 out of the 14 counties in the state of Massachusetts. So we have some specific challenges because our goal as a healthcare system and our goal as providers is to improve that rank and actually be the number one healthiest county. And you can do that, but you have to overcome a number of factors. That's what brings us here. So this is the model. This is an interesting empiric model, which I think you you may want to dig into if you if you wish to, and the model uh, is has been well worked out by the University of Wisconsin, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the model works like this. It holds that policies and programs at a state, national, and even regional level okay, drive health factors, and health factors drive health outcomes. Health outcomes might be, for example, mortality, morbidity, things like that. Okay. Within this framework, there are four basic buckets, if you will, of healthcare factors. For those of us in healthcare, we always thought the most important thing driving health was us. Um, but not true. So when you look at clinical care, traditional clinical care, primary care, access, things like that, if you look at the <coughs> impact on outcomes, it's only about 20% of the outcomes are related to, associated with the clinical care model. That doesn't mean we don't provide the best possible clinical care model we can, but that's not going to be enough. What are the big drivers? The biggest driver of all is social and economic factors. And those factors are the challenge we face in Berkshire County and in particular in North Adams and surrounding regions. One of the poorest areas of the county and the, st and the county is one of the poorest counties in the whole state. Within the social economic factors are things that are movable but with tremendous need for uh, investment. So it's education, employment, income, family and social support, and community safety. These are the social and economic factors. These are the true drivers of the health of the community and individuals within that community. Interestingly, health behaviors are 30%. And there is an inextricable relationship between social and economic factors and health behaviors. So people with poor education, low income, et cetera, tend to use tobacco more exercise less, eat poorly, abuse alcohol and drugs, and this is where we do get into the whole epidemic in terms of opioids and things like that, 
So these two are interrelated, but not irreversibly linked. So there have been programs around the country where a true focus on health behaviors can indeed overcome the social and economic headwinds. So that's an important piece. You can change this without necessarily changing all this. That does not mean that as a community, as a state, as a government, we don't need to try to invest in all this. But we can do things fairly quickly here. The other cup, fi final driver is the physical environment, okay? And the physical environment, although only 10%, can be very, very crucial to individuals. And this includes air and water quality, which in general around here is pretty good, in general, except for the PCBs, you know. Um, and then housing and transit, okay? And there is a tremendous challenge. That if you want a patient to come to a great service you think you have, and they can't get there because they don't have a car, they don't have access to public transportation because it is pretty poor, as you found out probably in, in this county, they can never get to that appointment, they cannot access services, they cannot benefit from those services because they're never able to get there. So this is the model, if you will, and this is the background, and as I said, we'll share with you the grant application. It's about 18 pages long, but it gives you, I think, a pretty good perspective on the community, the needs of that community, and what we're trying to do here. This is going to be a very brief review <coughs> of that grant application. So what I'm going to do now is hand things over to Mark. Um, and let him finish up this presentation. Is, any questions of what I've said so far? Does this make some sense? In terms of, okay. And we will link this, if you will, to the project which you are going to be undertaking. Yes? Sorry, so you were saying that the social and economic factors are linked to health behaviors, so that they can work on health behaviors? Yes. You, you, you can overcome those headwinds, and there are a few classic examples. One is a town called, a community called Franklin County, Maine, where for 25 years, a small group of people focused on, Frank, Franklin County, Maine, by the way, is as poor as, as Berkshire County. This group, instead of focusing on traditional health care, the hospital quality, etc., had all kinds of programs, including a van, etc., which reached out to the community, and over time, they took on smoking when it became something, you know, the Surgeon General declared dangerous. They took on hypertension. They took on drug abuse. They did this over a 25-year period. And what they were able to do is, if you look, this is a math class, there's a very tight correlation between income, okay, median family income, and health outcomes. And the line is like identity line. The, the, the outcomes are worse, obviously, the lower the socioeconomic status. And everybody, every county pretty much falls on that line except for Franklin County, Maine. And that there, the outcomes are far better, mortality much lower, morbidity much lower, than you'd expect from the socioeconomic status. <coughs> so yes, you can move it. And we've worked with the people from Franklin County, Maine for about 15 years, trying to copy what, what, the, what they've implemented. This, in a way, is a copy of that, because we know it works. It's published in JAMA. We can share that article with you. It's a very interesting article, as a matter of fact. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good. I think there and then there? I just have another question. Okay. Do you have some numbers or some quantification of what the difference is between that first and fourth county? Because I'm trying to make sure that it's not like, they're very, very similar, but you can still rank them. Oh, they're, they're pretty different. Yes, yeah. we, we'd have, what we'll do is we'll go to the county health rankings website and you can begin to see median family income and all that kind of stuff. You can begin to line it up. Um, we have some of that in the grant application. We have, you know, what the median income is and all that kind of stuff, us versus the rest of the state. So a lot of that information is there, okay? And then if you have more specific questions, you can email us and we'll try to get that information. Does that make some sense? Yeah. Okay. But they're, they're not, that's a really good question. Are they so tight that it really doesn't matter? They're, they're not tight at all. Example, um, I think the median per capita income for Monroe, a small town nearby, is $12,000 a year. Imagine that, $1,000 <coughs> a month. The median for Williamstown is 39,000. The income difference between Williamstown and North Adams is twofold different. So these are big differences. And you're at these very, when you get these very low median incomes, you can imagine 
you know, what a stress it is to try to get through the day. So those are the kind of numbers. That, okay. Yes? So just to build on that, it's more than just the median income, yeah. it's also the tax base. Do you have a couple of people or a couple of businesses yes. at the top of the spectrum that can provide significant amount of funds to the community right. for budgets? Absolutely. And that's where, you, again, you get in trouble. Where Williamstown, you have a few people. Right. You know. Like the college, the clock. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And a few individuals, as you know. And, and frankly, in North Adams, you do not have that. So you have a very, very tenuous tax base in North Adams. And that, again, then impacts the ability to deliver services at a local level. And that's where, frankly, our job as the Berkshire Health System, uh, uh, and what we're doing ourselves, and then what we've done through this grant is absolutely essential because no one else has the money to do it. So we have to come up with that money. And it's not a donation, it's what we need, but it's what we need to do. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, Mark will get a little more specific here, sort of taking off from what I said about the importance of socioeconomic factors, et cetera. So uh, w what I can say about the, uh, the median income in Berkshire County is about $14,000 per household less than the median average of the state of Massachusetts. So we are, we are more than one to two standard deviations from that median here in, in Berkshire County. Just to emphasize the, the point around um, economic infrastructure uh, and the extent to which that's impacting health. So this, this um, CDC slide is really a, uh, just another way of depicting what Gray just shared in the Robert Wood Johnson model. And uh, just to elaborate on some of the points that Gray made, and my background's in uh, internal medicine, nephrology, I was a kidney specialist. I, I still am, but I, I don't uh, practice that as much now. And uh, uh, the United States now recognizes integrative medicine as a legitimate uh, medical subspecialty, which uh, uh, I interpret as an enlightened signpost in terms of where, where we're moving. So I, I was in the first cohort of U.S. physicians to get boarded in integrative medicine. Seventy-five percent of the, the three-plus trillion dollars a year we spend in healthcare in the United States can be in some way traced to lifestyle. And as Gray alluded to, it's the socioeconomic factors that heavily influence lifestyle and behavior. So we have this interesting juxtaposition between a country that has seemingly unlimited resources. We spend more per capita than any other country on the planet by far. When you look at our public health outcomes compared to other industrialized countries, we're probably around 25th out of 50 plus countries. So we don't have a lot to show for the resources that we expend. And because most of this is lifestyle, healthy living, how we eat, how we move, how we interpret and respond to stress in our lives, how socially connected we are, how much meaning we cultivate in our work, in our love, in our play, the burden of environmental toxins that we confront. Healthy living does not happen in doctor's offices. It doesn't happen in hospitals. It doesn't happen in clinics. Healthy living and the road to healthy living is paved by the choices we make each and every moment. So, so much of this model, as Gray sort of set the foundation, forces us to confront the fact that our systems are poorly designed to be impacting what influences how people choose. Uh, and that's why, that's why there's so much emphasis now on beginning to really get our heads around social determinants. No healthcare system can do that without effective partnerships and developing clinical community capital and social capital. And it's a lot of what, what Gray and I do in our, in our work. So while these interventions are important, uh, they, they tend to be secondary in terms of where we need to be moving people in terms of choosing more wisely. And we talk about the importance of environment, physical environment. If someone were to give you a piece of paper and say, gee, your assignment is to design an environment that more than any other environment would make more likely that the inhabitant of that environment would choose as poorly as possible. Our communities are designed in that exact way. The foods at our supermarket, the foods that are most readily 
available when you walk into a, a department store or, or Walmart. Foods that are often the cheapest are least healthy. Um, our infrastructure, as Gray alluded to, for transportation in Berkshire County, this enormous geographic area is very limited. We have an older demographic here in Berkshire County. About 20% of our 130,000 inhabitants are 65 and older. And with that tends to come a higher burden of chronic complex disease. The state average there is about, about 15%. So all of that is just to reiterate what, what we confront in terms of challenging uh, an infrastructure that's not well designed to help people choose wisely uh, and, and how we can elaborate our clinical systems in ways that can better help us get around that. So in, this, in, in the spirit of efficiency, there's probably more information on this slide than, than anything Gray and I uh, present. And we've, we've, we've developed this concept, which uh, we think works pretty well. And let me, just take, let, <laughs> let, let me just take you through it quickly. So the average trajectory for, the, for an American, as they get older, is to have a very diminished quality of life. We also don't live as long in America as you may find in other countries, Canada, many of the Scandinavian countries, Japan, uh, despite the fact that they spend less per capita on health care than what we spend in America. So, you know, it can be said that we live too short and we die too long. Gray's a specialist, I'm a specialist. We, we spend a lot of our lives caring for people on this slippery slide and, and often it's impossible to move people upstream when your point of engagement is in the midst of free fall. So much of the work that we're doing in terms of population health is how can we compress morbidity? How can we take the average human being and allow them to realize a maximal health span, good quality of life, limited burden of chronic complex disease, living long, living well. We're all going to confront something catastrophic, but wouldn't it be better to have a great life until that time and then, boom, it's over? Which is how the rest of the mammalian world experiences life. Most mammals live pretty well up until something catastrophic happens and they die. So what you see up top here are, is the infrastructure that we've been developing to try to meet people at various parts of the curve that we engage them on and to connect them to resources, education, support that can allow them to choose more wisely in a way that can move them more upstream in terms of quality of life to lengthen the health span and to compress the morbidity. Uh, if anyone's interested in, in a sentinel paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, James Fries, F-R-I-E-S, in 1980, published this radical notion of compressing morbidity. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at Stanford. He's now in his late 80s to 90. Uh, and it was really, uh, uh, he was a bit of an intrepid explorer, recognizing population health required a very different model 40 years ago than what the health system at that time and certainly to this day has continued to evolve around. So we have several programs. Uh, some of them are, we would, we would call, Gray and I would call them upstream. We have uh, wellness programs, both for our own employees within the health system. Berkshire Health System is the, the largest employer in Berkshire County. We have 4,000 employees. And if you can't create models that can allow healthcare professionals to realize health, you're going to really struggle in trying to meet people who really struggle with socioeconomic and, and other social determinants. So a lot of our work is meeting our, our own families, uh, giving them more tools for wellness. We have a, uh, a collaborative program with the Canyon Ranch Institute, which is a nonprofit uh, run by uh, uh, Rich Carmona, who was the 17th Surgeon General. And it's about meeting people uh, who uh, confront significant health disparities, um, who struggle with health literacy, 
who struggle with um, health equity. And so these are, these are robust wellness programs that really teach people fundamentals, how to cook, how to read a food label, uh, how to uh, think about how each choice has a consequence to help them recognize where in their neighborhoods uh, are there resources that can help them begin to transcend in much the same way that Franklin County has done in, in, in Maine, uh, right here in the Berkshires. So these are programs that are very much around prevention. They're holistic. We focus on nutrition. We focus on movement. We focus on stress reduction, mind-body, neuroscience, right? The sophisticated way in which we now know our brains interpret our environments and translate that interpretation in a way that can either enhance our quality of life for a long time or begin to enable it to deteriorate. Uh, so we tend to translate the science in those areas in ways that people can begin to apply in their day-to-day -day lives. And then the fourth dimension of that is the social connection and, and recognizing that social capital and people being connected to other people is critical in creating traction and in, in allowing one to navigate what can be extenuating circumstances. Uh, and we know that um, relatively modest inventions of resources upstream can have a much greater impact on quality of life down the road, much better return on the investment, uh, which is why I think from a value proposition, those that pay us, federal government, state governments, the payers, insurers, are beginning to place more emphasis on the need to be focusing in these fundamental primary preventive uh, strategies. We have other uh, prevention models uh, that are alive and well, and uh, uh, you experience this largely through primary care networks. Uh, so we have these patient-centered medical homes, primary care practices now that um, have evolved structures that leverage data, registries. Uh, if I'm a primary care provider, I'm taking care of 2,000 people. I now have the capacity to know of those 2,000, how many have high blood pressure? And of those, how many are not well controlled? Same might be said of diabetes. So as a provider and the resources I have within my practice, how can I better match the resource to those individuals of the highest risk? Uh, and that's essentially what a primary care medical home is all about. We have another grant. Uh, this was a, a $9 million grant. We're in the last year of it, Prevention Wellness Trust Fund. This is a Department of Public Health grant, and I'd be glad to share more detail offline if anyone is interested. This is really an innovation grant that uh, is challenging clinical communities to more assertively develop non-clinical partnerships, um, this, this, this community-based capital. So in this model, primary care providers, hospitals, emergency departments start to collaborate more closely with places like the YMCA, like senior centers, like um, uh, public health uh, infrastructure, uh, the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition here in North Adams, a, a very important stakeholder for, for locals who identify the coalition as a place they can go to get information about resources and get connected to those resources. So our partnerships begin to shift. So my relationship with the Y is every bit as important as my relationship with Gray and the cardiologist and and other clinical stakeholders. Uh, so we, we have developed some uh, very interesting uh, models here uh, that we think are some of the, some of the best in the state. Uh, we are using our information systems within the, within the restraints of HIPAA and confidentiality and privacy and working with our YMCAs, working with um, them, Volunteers in Medicine in South County, working with the Northern Berkshire Community Coalition to help people with diabetes, with hypertension, who smoke, uh, who are at risk of falling. Those are, those are four areas that we're focusing on. And in addition to what might be a need for medication to treat a diabetic or a hypertensive, developing community-based programs like Get Cuffed, which is a, an educational program for people with high blood pressure. They get a cuff, their own cuff. They're taught how to use it. They have classes, one-on-one -on -one and group-related classes. This is, these, are, these are models of empowerment. 
Um, uh, we have a, a matter of balance class to help people reduce their risk of falling, Tai Chi. Uh, we have a smoking cessation. Um, these are all community-based um, uh, 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 efforts that we are empowering community-based organizations around so that they can more effectively partner with us and we can more effectively partner with them because healthy living doesn't occur where we live and spend most of our time working. Um, so these are tremendously important and again we know that we can get a lot of bang for the buck if we can identify more people at this level, get them on a trajectory that otherwise uh, they may find themselves heading down. And this brings us to more assertive disease management. So these are people who are a bit more evolved, more advanced diabetics, people with poorly controlled hypertension. Uh, this might include depression, it might include uh, addiction, people who confront seemingly impossible circumstances in their lives, struggling to find hope, struggling to find light at the end of the tunnel. And a lot of this work is about giving people hope helping them realize possibility that they may not have realized was possible. So our patient-centered medical homes focus assertively on disease management. And uh, as Gray set the stage with our chart grant through the Health Policy Commission, our Neighborhood for Health, this is a transitional care model. People who are admitted to Berkshire Health Systems uh, for any diagnosis, um, alcohol for detox, depression with, say, suicidal uh, ideation, uh, poorly controlled diabetes. They come into our system if they're from a northern Berkshire County zip code, the system flags them. It alerts a team that the grant has supported within our hospital. This is an RN coordinator. We have a licensed clinical social worker because many of these are behavioral health related issues they, and these coexist. So as I'll show you in a minute, our model is not just primary care, it's not just diabetes, it's an interdisciplinary model that any person could drop into that would make more likely that the various facets or, or, or pieces of the puzzle can in some way be addressed and coordinated. So we identify those people, we engage them, that's a whole interesting conversation within itself, engagement, motivational interviewing emotional intelligence, how do you somehow get into the mindset of an individual who basically perceives threats everywhere, who has very little hope in their tank, who perhaps hasn't been met with the greatest empathic relationships in their lives and even within the health system. Once these folks are identified, a call is made, these are warm handoffs to the neighborhood, right in North Adams at the old North Adams Regional Hospital, and through care navigation and coordination on that and before the person leaves the hospital, a plan is developed so that within 48 hours, we have, we, these are the metrics that we hold ourselves to. If the person wants to engage, within 48 hours, we do all we can to assure that they will show up and then begin to connect them to the resources within the neighborhood that will allow them to get what they need to give them traction in their lives and to begin to move them upstream. Uh, so this is a, it's an innovative model. The focus of the grant, as you'll see from the proposal that we submitted, when you have a chance to look at that, we had four weeks to do this, uh, a time compressed challenge. Um, originally, this would have gone to North Adams Regional Hospital, which closed. And as, as, as Gray framed this, part of what we ask you is, how can a community any community USA who's lost economic infrastructure, who's lost a community hospital, respond in a way that creates value. Improving outcomes, less cost, focusing on the social determinants, and that, I think that's as, as uh, demoralizing as the landscape can feel at times. This is really, uh, we think, really exciting, innovative work that we know that folks on Beacon Hill are looking at what's happening here in the Berkshires, DPH, Health Policy Commission, and we hope that we can develop prototypes that you can all help us inform in a more sophisticated way that will become national uh, prototypes. And we feel strongly that we can do this work. 
Um, so that's a little bit about the model. These are folks on the slippery slide. We want to try to give them more traction. And if I might just add, this is the data set that we're going to be sharing with you. This is the group of patients who are running through the system. And we really want to know, is it working? Is it efficient? And how can we improve it? So we have a large data set over time in terms of patients all the way from showing up at the hospital all the way through, do they get to the services, what services are most impactful, et cetera. This is our question for you. Not an easy question, a lot of confounders, but a very important question, not only for us, but more importantly for the citizens or community of North Adams. And from a policy perspective, is this a model that is worth rolling out across the state and perhaps across the country? Is this a brand new model? Yeah, beautiful. So I, I know our time's a bit limited. I'll, I'll move a bit more quickly. But you know, we spend a lot of time in sophisticated clinical settings. Gray and I trained in very sophisticated places. You could do almost anything to anyone at any time. Uh, uh, and uh, these are tremendously expensive propositions. The, the width of these arrows, uh, to some extent, uh, is symbolic of the amount of resources spent. Uh, it costs much less to get a dietitian or a licensed clinical social worker to help a person understand food and how to manage their stress in a more productive way uh, than it is to uh, take someone to the OR or spend a month in a critical care unit. Um, so, and, and we're now shifting as this is really what this is all about. And rarely are we able, even though we can save lives and maybe lengthen lives, Rarely do we improve the quality of lives that we serve. As a kidney guy, I've done a lot of uh, you know, dialysis. Uh, dialysis will cost $175,000 a year per person. Um, it keeps them alive, and there's, surely there's some value to that. Both my parents ended up on dialysis, but these can be, uh, these are lives that often confront tremendous suffering. Uh, and, and so part of our challenge is beginning to recognize that prolonging life um, uh, has little value if you're not improving the quality of that individual's life. And that's what people want. And then we have this, um, uh, you know, people have cardiac arrest. We have these sophisticated teams that can take someone who's on the verge of dying and pluck them back. And again, it's not, there's some worthiness to that, but rarely does a person realize a life upon survival of a cardiac arrest in the hospital setting that that we would want for ourselves or for our loved ones. So ultimately, how can we be more upstream, proactive, and, uh, and I'm gonna let Gray just quickly touch on this important dimension of quality adjusted life years, because that's really what this is about. It's just about rectangularizing the relationship between quality of life and aging. Do you wanna to touch on qualities real quick, quality? Gray? I, I how many of you have heard of qualities? Yes? A little bit. Okay, tell me. More like that. More than that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How much, what's the economic impact of not having health that you should? Exactly. That's excellent. Excellent. So qualities are quality adjusted life years. <laughs> so what you do is, you know, it's pretty easy to calculate, okay, this person lived three years less than they might have. That's one. Yeah, that's one way to do it. But you're trying to integrate the quality of those years on dialysis versus living a healthy life. And that integration can occur by multiplying the number of years by the quality of those years. And that the quality is a self-assessment based upon surveys, et cetera. Okay. So the whole idea here is that by rectangularizing this so that right here you fall off your bicycle and that's it or something like that. Instead of going down this slippery slope and having disease upon disease and be hospitalized over and over again, this whole area under the curve, being a math course, it <laughs> represents what you could gain. This is an opportunity. And you can see this is opportunities. It's an opportunity from a cost perspective, as you put it, but it's an opportunity from a very personal perspective to live a far more fulfilling life, not just a longer life. So I think, I think that's probably a good explanation. Does that make sense to people? Great, and I just have a few more, few more slides that I'll go through uh, really quickly here. So these, 
These are just some of the partners that we have, uh, both through our Prevention Wellness Trust Fund grant, Department of Public Health, and through the Neighborhood for Health, Health Policy Commission grant. So we're the coordinating partner. Uh, we're working very closely with the Nor Northern Berkshire Community Coalition, our Boards of Health, uh, Public Health Alliance, uh, our small critical access hospital in South County, our health, uh, Tri-Town Health Departments uh, that attempt to implement policy. Uh, we, we can help uh, uh, develop capacity there through these collaborations. YMCA and North Adams and Pittsfield, uh, community health programs, these are federally funded clinics that are, these are important partners and stakeholders. Historically, we've, we've lived in, in silos. And now uh, this just symbolizes how these walls are coming down. Excuse me. I'm not sure what happened there. There we go. Uh, Volunteers in Medicine, Berkshire South is a recreational center down in, in South County. So this is our neighborhood for health. Uh, it's at the North Adams Regional Hospital. Again, people that are uh, hospitalized uh, at Berkshire Medical Center are identified uh, and based on their unique needs. These are very personalized programs. Uh, we connect them to a neighborhood that has a, a nurse practitioner, a diabetes support, smoking cessation, behavioral health is, is key. If you're a diabetic and you're depressed and frequently they coexist, it's much less likely until something is done to help improve your depression that you're going to be able to eat better and move more. Uh, we have, um, again, uh, very much of a, 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 a navigation model here, uh, nutrition, congestive heart failure, uh, day treatment for addiction, and perhaps most importantly, a community health worker. Uh, these are a relatively new dimension of our healthcare model. Uh, these are peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, folks that are trained uh, in ways that um, um, connect them to resources in the community. They work with clients who are referred here, um, meet them where they're at, which is, which is very important. They may do house calls. They will call if a person has an appointment that they've not shown up for. They help them know where transportation is at. If they need a taxi voucher, they help with that. If there's a, a food pantry that would, would benefit them, they connect them to that. This is a, an intense uh, uh, community-based liaison um, that is very central to this interdisciplinary model. And we believe it's these interdisciplinary models that are the future of where care is moving. And I think, you know, the community health workers uh, actually evolved from South Africa of all places. And now, you know, we're catching up. And they realize they are the glue. They are what make these communities work. They are the people who know the resources in the community, who gain the trust of these individuals, who then link all these resources together, ranging from food security all the way through, you need to go to the hospital. Um, you know, talk about a cost-effective model. Uh, these people are usually high school grads fr from the local area who are trained as community health workers over um, less than a year, yeah. much less than a year, yeah. and then go out in the community and, and basically when you sort of ask people, gee, what's the most important thing in terms of your health at this point, they'll almost always say the community health worker, they won't say the doctor. Because these are the people who are really making the personal connections and making sure people are getting the services they need broadly defined. Yeah. Yes? The number of the people included in the data set? Yeah, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll have the number of appointments with that person, et cetera, and that's going to be an important piece. Are we getting people to the community health workers efficiently and effectively? I would argue that almost everybody in that data set probably should be connected to community health worker. And I think you'll see a gradual building over time, but nowhere near we need to get to. And then part of the data set might say, hey, if you really optimize access to community health workers, you'd need four or five or something like that. So that would be part of it, absolutely. We have six community health workers in our Prevention Wellness Trust Fund. Our, our vision is to literally train and develop a small army of community health workers as we move forward and look to take this work and scale it up. But there's the six are all over the county. Up here, we don't have probably have enough. Yeah. So this is just another way of depicting the fact that we know people who struggle with um, uh, equity uh, issues. Um, they'll never, they'll never get to the fruit. So how can we level the playing field in much the same way that someone that is more resource intense 
uh, can have the same exact opportunities. And, and this is largely around systems. Um, so helping develop systems that make choosing wisely easier. Farmers markets, uh, better transportation, uh, better food in our food pantries, um, uh, you know, bike paths, um, economic stimulus, and other, other ways to help people realize um, that the environment uh, is so important as we, as we uh, develop this. So that, we ran a little bit over. Um,